اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد و الثناء للہ رب العالمین بارئ الخلائق اجمعین ثم الصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our imam, please recite a salawat. We've been trying to discuss some of the dimensions of how to abstain from sin, taking this lesson from the verses of the Holy Qur'an that this month is supposed to be helping us abstain from sin, avoid sin. We've tried to discuss a little bit some of the concepts that are good to know in order to be able to abstain from sin. One of the points that we raised in one of the beginning nights, which has raised some questions apparently, was the idea that we mentioned. Some people have said very proudly that we should try to teach our children to have love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of teaching them to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I very briefly touched on it, I didn't think it was something very difficult to understand. So I didn't spend too much time on it. But apparently it was kind of maybe misunderstood, maybe it was understood correctly, but it's something that is not acceptable to some, maybe, I don't know. The idea that we were mentioning is that based on the verses of the Holy Qur'an that call the believers to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were emphasizing the importance of the existence of fear, the necessity of having fear, and the necessity and importance of implanting that in the heart of the child. If that is implanted, then when parents are not around, if they have things that temptation, friends, whatever it is that calls them towards sin, any form of sin, even as a child, although it is not going to be considered a sin, it's not going to be causing them to be responsible for their actions because they're not responsible. However, it may get them into the wrong habits. But one element that can be very strong in keeping them away from sins at that age is fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we can teach them that, there will be an inner police, if we can call it, something internal that's going to keep us from committing sins. We weren't trying to say that it's bad to talk about God's love, that we shouldn't have that, or how the balance of that is with uh, fear. The importance that we were lying is that, unfortunately, out here, it's kind of considered bad. The more intellectual you become, the more you're supposed to put fear aside. They say fear is because of lack of understanding. The more you understand, the less you have fear. Well, for certain things, yeah. If fear is based on negligence and ignorance, if it's removed, then the fear is gone. Some people have fear of jinn. They scare themselves to death because of jinns. At night, when it's dark, the boogeyman or somebody's going to come and get you. Some children are scared off with that. Well, that's based on ignorance. We don't realize our relationship with jinn. Jinn is a reality, don't remove that from the picture. But the way you understand it, the way we understand it sometimes is wrong. And because of that, we develop some form of fear or phobia for it. If that's the reason why we are fearful, then yes, if ignorance is the cause of it, you remove it, fear is gone. 
Some of the fears that we have about our fellow brothers and sisters, we have this ice that's between us. We fear discussing things, talking to one another a lot of times. You enter masjid sometimes and people aren't willing to say salam to you, that there's an ice, there's this fear kind of. And the more you get to know one another, the more those veils of fear are removed. That's true. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you know about Him, the more you fear Him, not really fearing Him, maybe this requires a little bit of explanation. Again, I'm going, I'm, I'm sidetracking here, or maybe even backtracking, we weren't supposed to discuss this, but on Saturday night somebody asked a question, then yesterday again it was raised, so let me clarify this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not scary one bit. He's absolute perfection. There's nothing in him that would be in and of itself scary. However, part of being absolute perfect and having all those perfect traits is that imperfections are not liked. Things that are bad, evil, oppression, that is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when that is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going to treat it in an appropriate manner. In reality, the fear that we have is that since He's all knowledgeable, all powerful, all knowing of what we have done, what we do which is wrong, which deserves punishment, we are afraid of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment for us is going to be because of our own actions. The important thing is to know that He is the best person, the, the best being, the most perfect being, but that means that we're going to be responsible in regards to Him. That means if we do something wrong, then we're going to be held accountable. It's not that, oh, He's all merciful. Yes, He's all merciful, but He's got some other traits that are all perfections as well. And that is muntaqim. If you do something wrong, then he's going to take revenge of that. He's not going to allow that to escape. If you oppress somebody, it's going to be taken out on you. You're going to be held accountable. So that is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to learn more about and try to place that in our hearts. As I said, the more we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how powerful he is, how knowledgeable he is, nothing escapes as Dua al-Kumail Amir al-Mu'mineen salamullah alayhi says that you have put these angels, kiram al katibin They're supposed to be writing all my deeds. Then there are things that escape them, but you notice them. And out of your mercy, you're not letting anybody else know about that. He's very merciful. He forgives, but he knows all the misdeeds that you and I commit. That's scary. The all-powerful, the one that is helping you become all perfect and we sidetrack, we go on the other path and he knows about it and he's all powerful and wisdom is that he doesn't just treat that like the way he treats a believer as again in Dua Al-Kumail Allah subhanahu wa or the Imam narrates or quotes this verse of the Holy Quran that can a believer, a mu'min, a pious person and a fasiq person be treated the same. It's impossible, you can't treat them the same. So the more you learn about this, the more that fear should increase. We explained yesterday that one of the elements that helps us, gives us positive fear is death. The remembrance of death is extremely important to our spiritual growth, the more we have that, the more we realize it, the more we have it in here and not forget it, the more we will benefit from life. The more we'll be able to perfect ourselves. We explained that, we said in our context of our discussion, we were talking about the effects of sin and we wanted to discuss the effect of some of the sins or sins in general in regards to death because previous to that and prior to that we talked about some of the effects of some of the sins in this life in this world then we want to talk about what happens and the effect of sin on death there's different effects for example how death happens there are forms of death that are very scary to us like a lot of us fear and have this phobia of being choked to death, okay, being suffocated. 
any time that you're in a situation where you start feeling that there's not enough oxygen you start getting really really scared you have that phobia in you some forms of death are very scary to some and less scary to others and of course some people don't fear death at all but we're not talking at that level right now most of us us have fear of death the form of death could change depending on our actions depending on some of the sins that's one effect another effect that I want to talk about tonight is the effect of when death happens how long are we going to live As I said we all have everybody wants to live longer in this world Everybody has that. Of course, we do have hadith that says, and verses as well, of the Holy Qur'an, that true believers don't have this wish of staying in this world. For true believers, this world is a prison. This world is an obstacle. There's an interpretation of the verse of the Holy Qur'an that discusses the story of Prophet Moses with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's two verses that shouldn't be mistook. They're not the same. They're different. One of them is about Prophet Moses going to the mountain with some of the Jewish people, some of Bani Israel. They had requested to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jaharatan with their eyes. And then it says, when they requested that, and Prophet Moses with, was with them, a sa'iqa, lightning came, they all died. Except apparently Prophet Moses went unconscious and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were brought back to life. I don't want to get into that story. But there's another verse that Prophet Moses asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make me anzur ilayk, that I see you. The Mufassirin say, Prophet Moses knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't be seen with this eye. And the form of sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing him is a spiritual one. Now a prophet, not just any prophet, Prophet Moses, one of the Ulul Azm prophets, he definitely has a level of faith that is far beyond ours he is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a certain extent through the eyes of the heart the spiritual form of seeing he is having that but he wants more one of the things about Prophet Moses that is very clear we find that in hadith and in the verses one of which I just hinted to and pointed to is his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's called Kalimullah. He spoke to Allah. Allah spoke to him. That's a very intimate relationship. He's proud of that. He wanted to have this form of a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he had was not enough. He wanted more. And then the verse says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tajalla lil jabal. He had some form of manifestation. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ لِلْجَبَلْ جَعَلَهُ دَكًّا وَخَرَّ مُوسَى صَعِقًا When he manifested in the mountain, the mountain just fell, it turned into powder. What? And, and Musa, Moses, Prophet Moses fell to the ground unconscious. They interpret this as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing the Prophet, showing Prophet Moses that because of your attachment with this body, anything beyond your level of faith right now and what you're asking for is not possible in this world, in this dunya. You have to leave this body. For a true believer, it's like they're being forced Many of the ahadith, Amir al muminin and a few of them describes the believers. He says, if you allow them and it's, if it's up to them, they would want to escape this body. It's a limitation. It limits their freedom. But this is far beyond our understanding. We want to live in this world longer. We would like to live even a few more days. 
will do anything, pay any price to just live a few more months, a year or two. So because of this want of living in this dunya, many of the ahadith talk about sins that shorten our lives. Of course, for us, there's another dimension too, which is positive. What I just described of us wanting to be in this dunya is because of our ignorance. That fear of death is because of our ignorance. We don't realize that the hereafter is actual life. And this life is the limited form of it. But there is something positive. There is a positive reason for why one would want to live longer. And we have du'as to pray for a longer life. And that is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further and more. And be able to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where we're at, there's ranks that we can reach closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can reach and as the ahadith say at least for our level that can only happen in this dunya once we leave this world that's the end of it we can't do anything to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for that reason it is actually if anybody has this intention for living longer and as long as he is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants to live and get closer to him then that's positive now we have some of the ahadith that describe to us sins, especially certain ones, shorten our lifespan. One of them I will read to you. This hadith is from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullah <coughs> He says, Kana Abi yaqul. He quotes his father Imam al-Baqir salamullah alayhi that نعوذ بالله من الذنوب التي تعجل الفناء. We seek refuge to Allah from the sins that hasten the annihilation, death, in other words. And the same words are re same concept is repeated with different words. وتقرب الأجل. They bring closer the ajal. See, we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of us a lifespan in this world. We are definitely كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every nafs, every soul, every person is going to taste death. No one's going to escape it because this world was never intended to be eternal. The hereafter is eternal. We're given a certain span of life. That's, let's just for our explanation today say, that's the maximum we can live. We're not going to be living beyond that. But certain things that we may do, or certain obligations that we may not perform, are going to cause that to shorten. That's what they're going to do. <clears throat> so the Imam says, we seek refuge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from these sins. وَتُخَلِّدْ diyar They empty the cities. In other words, people start dying. If we can... Now this is not something that we've been trying to expand on. We have concept, the concept of certain sins and the sins generally becoming widespread causes the destruction of cities, civilizations. That's something on its own to discuss. We're not going to get into that. That's what the Imam is referring to here. The first two that deal with those تُعَجِّلُ الْفَنَاءِ in تُقَدِّمْ الْآجَالِ They shorten our lifespan. They nearen our time of death. Are قَطِيعَةُ الرَّحِمْ وَالْعُقُوقِ Disconnecting from Rahim. Disconnecting from family members. People that are related to us through blood. We have a responsibility towards them. Disconnecting, not having ties at all, cutting off relationship is one of the causes of our life coming to an end earlier than expected. 
recite a salawat, please. <coughs> I think all of us, or most of us here, have heard a lot of sayings about Qat'ur Rahim. Fortunately, one of the good things about each, every culture that we approach has got positives and negatives. One of the positives, and there's no culture by the way, there's no culture that in and of itself is supreme. The only culture that is supreme is Islamic culture, which is not actually a full culture because depending on where you're coming from, it's going to have a touch of that region. For a lot of different reasons, that's a different discussion. But the culture minus that religion, the culture in and of itself, there is none that is superior than the other to say, oh, if you're coming from this part of the world, you're better or whatever. No. Just remove that from your mind. But one of the positives in Eastern culture is keeping up ties and relationships. And one of the negatives of Western culture is that that's not very strong. Parents and children don't even have too much of a relationship in the Western culture. This is very wrong. People not caring because look, remember, when it says Qat'ur Rahim is a sin, when you look at the verses of the Holy Quran, what you find is kind of the opposite of that being wajib instead of this being haram. It says, wa You're supposed to be kind, be good to your relatives. You're supposed to have a healthy relationship and help them out. Be kind to them. Even if it's at the level of just a nice conversation. <clears throat> Not that every time they see you, you're always picking on them or saying something that hurts their feelings. It's not about that connection in and of itself. It's the form of connection that is kind. You need to show kindness to them. Helping out financially if they require that. If they're depressed, if they are in tough times and difficulties, they've lost a loved one to try and go and uh, cheer them up and help them out in whatever way that we can. That's one of the positives of Eastern culture and Western culture needs to learn a bit of that. We need to try to develop that in ourselves. And before we know it, one of the things that happens to people who've come here and migrated from the East as well is that you start they say <clears throat> the earth, the, the dirt, the soil in a flower plant started smelling good. And they asked, where did, that come, where did that come from? It said, you know, I'm the soil that I was. I'm the same dirt and soil that exists everywhere. What causes me to have that beautiful scent is the flower that's planted and is around me. Just being around that flower gives it good scent. Being in this society, if we're not care careful, causes us to develop, without even realizing it, some of the negatives in this culture. And of course it helps us develop some of the positive, like being a little more organized of this culture. But it also gives us some of that negative touch. We've got to be careful with that. But what I want to focus on a little bit here, <clears throat> is to clear up our perception of this responsibility of keeping up ties with family sometimes this is taken to an extreme sometimes keeping up ties is used against faith in other words practically the result of that is losing faith instead of helping faith because one of the reasons of all these ties is to keep a society together for if you have blood relationship you're supposed to have more ties if beyond having blood relationship like being siblings or being family they're your parents they're your cousins your uncles your nephews your nieces beyond that or if they don't have that at least they have faith then we need to keep ties with them as well, with believers. So it's all to keep us all together. And there's other benefits as well, I don't want to get into that. 
But sometimes we see this becomes a problem instead of helping out. We use the religious concept because look, a lot of times what we end up doing is we mix up culture and religion. And we always or a lot of times manage to misplace them. Take a religious concept, use it culturally. Take a cultural concept, use it religiously. Examples. <coughs> Recite a salawat, please. <coughs> A lot of times people come and ask us about relationship with family members that are not practicing. Okay, if you ask any marja's office that and just leave it at that, they're not practicing, should we have ties? They'll say yes. But there's two things that are very, very ambiguous here and can make a big difference in the ruling. One is you're saying that they're not practicing. What level of lack of practice do they have? There's different ones. <clears throat> I may commit a sin here and there. Well, I'm not practicing to that extent. I may not be praying. That's another level. I may not be practicing at all. That's a completely different level. I may be making fun of religion. That's even a worse level. Okay. What do you mean by not practicing? Another thing that's there is, what do you mean by cutting relationship or keeping relationship? Both of these need to be discussed a bit. We are supposed to keep ties in a way that doesn't harm our Islam and we cannot commit sins in order to keep ties. No, you don't commit sins and leave that form of socialization with the family for example the brother is young say we go to our cousins or we go to our aunt's, aunt's house or our uncle's place and my cousins don't wear hijab am I allowed to go there well we go there we have to shake hands this is how we've been living our lives they don't wear hijab I'm supposed to go there and see them. If I don't want to go, they feel upset. If I go there, I don't shake hands, I don't look at them, which is my religious responsibility. They're not going to like that. <clears throat> Easy way out, not to visit them at all. That's considered by them cutting off ties. We can't do that. Another example. <clears throat> Marriages, ceremonies, reception ceremonies, nikah ceremonies. Unfortunately, this very sacred event in our lives has become one of the most sinful events in our lives. People that I can't even imagine them. Why in the world are you making these decisions? Why do you do this to yourself? Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we have DJs in our weddings? Why are they mixed? You can't have a marriage ceremony without women dressing up. It's impossible. You want to have it mixed? It's haram. It's a sin. I swear to God, it is a sin. Full of sins, not just one sin, plenty of sins that happen on that night. How bad it is to begin our life, our married life, with sins. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to give us barakah for that? A tap on the shoulder, good job, mashallah, you got married. What type of congratulations can I give to that? Congratulations for a night of sin. Good job. I don't know what happens to us. Like people that we consider religious, they're sometimes, I mean, in Iran, I don't know about here, I don't know if we have any hafidh of the Holy Quran, anyone that has memorized the Holy Quran. You have people that have memorized the entire Holy Quran, they wear hijab, they've gone to Hajj, they've done this, they've done that. Everything seems to be okay as soon as you want to marry their daughter, and then all of a sudden things change. They can't accept to have a marriage without music. 
without a bunch of guys coming into the women's section to see the bride and the groom together for what? why the hell do you want to do that? what happened to your ghira? allow men, non-mahram men to see the women like that? these are great sins now when a person, a young person especially because those are the people that come and ask us especially or mostly it's them that come and ask us like we're invited to this gathering we know it's mixed we know they have a DJ there are relatives what are we supposed to do can we go or not don't go don't go technically if you ask me I'll break it down for you there are some cases that in theory may be okay for us to attend but I know what it means to be young and enter that gathering with the music and mixed and you know all the colorful faces <laughs> that's not a gathering you want to be in that's not a gathering that the Imam of our time would see us in and say MashaAllah you want to have your Imam congratulate you for the marriage or you want him to cry you know he has we have hadith on this the Imam receives reports of what people do there's one hadith that says twice a week and when he receives news that the Shia have committed sins he, he weeps so the night of marriage is the night that the Imam of our time weeps think of that this form of relationship with relatives is not recommended by Islam that's cultural that's not Islamic in any way if you don't go to that session you have worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you go there you have disobeyed him don't think don't let anybody confuse you no matter how difficult it is no matter how difficult it is just leave it believe me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show you how you will be respected amongst your family if you do the right thing you will be even respected amongst them they will see you as someone that is stronger more firm a stronger believer and of course if they're the type of people that are going to be making fun of us who cares who cares why would you want to have ties with them anyway we have verses of the Holy Qur'an, if you see people, it doesn't mention who they are. If you see people that are making fun of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs, making fun of His laws is an example of that. Making fun of religious people because of their religion is an example of that. If you see people doing that, don't stick around. Even if you're not doing it, sometimes God forbid we join them. We shouldn't, shouldn't join them, we should leave them, leave them to it, let them commit the sin they want. This form of relationship is not intended. You shouldn't cut off ties completely, but who said you need to go over their house? If going over their house means committing sins, or there's a good chance I'm going to commit sins, don't go. Give them a call. When you see them in the masjid, tell them come to the masjid, we'll see you as well. Say, Salamun Alaikum. You give your salams, that's enough, that's sufficient being angry at them for non-religious reasons and cutting off ties because of that that is what is considered qati'atul rahim don't use this to form relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden us I gave you that hadith that the Imam told his companion why in the world are you hanging around this guy this guy is denying making fun of the Ahlul Bayt he's the enemy of the Ahlul Bayt why are you hanging around he said he's my uncle he wasn't like his, I don't know, dad's, auntie's, uh, husband's sister or something, okay? He was his exact uncle, his own direct uncle. The Imam said, don't hang around him. Just because he's your uncle, that doesn't mean you're supposed to be hanging around him. You see him on the street, say, Salaamu Alaikum, that's it. Don't hang, around, don't hang around him. They are the ones that have told us about this Qati'atul Rahim. So, 
Qat'ur rahim is a great sin, however that doesn't justify us having whatever form of relationship with our families, even those that devastate us, they create problems religiously for us, for our children. A lot of times we neglect that. You go to some of these people's homes, it's going to have negative effects on the children, even if you're not touched. What they have on their TV, what their children say, what they see over there is going to have a negative effect on them. Don't forget that. So that form of relationship is not intended. Yes, you, can, you need to have some level of relationship, but giving them phone calls, even if they're in the same city, is enough. You've done your responsibility. It's their fault and their problem that you're not having any more than that. And we're not supposed to have any more than that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Ahlul Bayt to hasten the return of our Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, by this noble month, by the Shaheed of this month, Amirul Muminin, to enable us to become close companions of our Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of and give good health to all of our marajah and especially the leader. We ask him to forgive us all of our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all the believers and all people of the world of the oppression that they're facing.